Your Partner in Success Radio is a free business podcast with host Denise Griffiths. It's all about great stories, conversation, and context to help you move your business and life forward with actionable tips and advice from her guest experts. To listen and subscribe, just find us on iTunes, Google Play, or wherever you consume your podcasts. Welcome to your Partner in Success Radio, Zoom meetings. Love them or hate them, they are part of our reality these days. You can't avoid them. I'm your host, Denise Griffiths, and today Joel Schwartzberg rejoins us. This is his third time to share just how to elevate your points and your presence so your message doesn't get overlooked in the Zoom crowd. And I don't know about y'all, but the more people I see their faces on a Zoom crowd, I know that I'm going to be darting back and forth, who's talking, who's doing what. It can get very confusing. So about Joel, currently he is the Senior Director of Strategic and Executive Communications for a national nonprofit organization, and he has been teaching presentation techniques to clients including American Express, Blue Apron, the Brennan Center for Justice, the American Jewish Committee, and North Point Ministry since 2006. His book, which I have, he sent it to me in 2018, Get to the Point, Sharpen Your Message, and Make Your Words Matter, was released in 2017, and his articles have appeared in Fast Company, Harvard Business Review, and Toastmaster Magazine. Joel is also a former national and state champion competitive public speaker and college forensics coach who was inducted into the National Forensics Association Hall of Fame in 2002. He's got a lot to talk about, so I'm not going to go through all the points. I'm going to let him do it so I don't cut into his time. Good morning, Joel. Welcome back to the show. It's good to have you here. And honestly, as we were talking in my virtual green room, this is your third visit, so welcome back. Thank you so much, Denise, and I'm proud to be here, proud to be your partner in success as well as your audience's partner in success. And this Zoom thing really came up all of a sudden. I think we've been using it, at least where I work, we've been using it sporadically. But now we've all had to jump into that pool, and we've noticed a lot of uh, problems with it. We've also noticed a lot of opportunities with it, but not all, all of us take advantage of or are able to navigate around those challenges. And that's why you're here. And I'm like you. I mean, Zoom, I've been on them. Um, I'm there as audio only because I do not allow anybody to take pictures of me, never have, since I was five years old. It's a lifelong thing. But I also don't have a camera on my giant monitors, which, you know, keeps me safe. So I get on them and I'm listening. But I'll be honest with you, I would much rather just because this is how I learn, I would much rather listen than watch. And if I'm forced to watch a bunch of people on a screen, this is just me personally, I get irritated. Do you do you find that that happens? I mean, it really irritates me to watch somebody scratching their head or, you know, getting kind of cranky looking. I just don't want to see that. I would re- much rather hear what you have to say. So our, what are you seeing that people are kind of going, Zoom, really? I have to put my camera on, really? Or is it just me? Well, <laughs> well I'm glad you ended with, is, is it just me, Denise? Because one of the things I want to pull out from what you said is that we're, we have different learning preferences. And so you said you like to receive things through audio versus visually. I'm actually the opposite of that. I like to process things visually, and I don't process them as effectively audio. So if someone says something to me, I really need a visual reinforcement. And I like Zoom, and I like PowerPoint, for that matter, for the same reason. But the larger issue, what you're talking about, you know, whenever the, the country or uh, society has an issue, we need to put a label on it. So the label for this is called Zoom Fatigue. And it's a real thing. And there are four elements to it, some of which you, you kind of described. One is this idea that our brain has to be in work mode and home mode simultaneously. Uh, We can't really reconcile being in pajama bottoms and being at work, Uh, being in our uh, kitchen and being at work. And toggling back and forth is exhausting, and that makes us a little tired trying to navigate those two worlds simultaneously. 
The other thing is, like you mentioned, being bombarded by multiple visual cues at the same time. So we have 5, 10, 15, 20 uh, people we're looking for in what I call this Brady Bunch grid. We're dealing with chat at the same time. Sometimes there's a poll. Sometimes someone's sending us an instant message at the same time. That is also very exhausting and called Zoom fatigue. The third thing is trying to toggle between multiple things at once. A lot of times when we're on a Zoom call, if we're not participating, what are we doing? We're checking our email. We're thinking, maybe I can edit this document at the same time, or maybe I can respond to this, or just check off this to-do box, or you know, go to my personal Gmail. It's an inclination uh, when we're not actively participating in someone. But one thing I've learned, and a lot of people talk about this, you'll even see some TED Talks about this, is there's no such thing as multitasking. What we're actually doing is toggling between two things, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And that also is mentally taxing and exhausting. So we think we can handle email and Zoom at the same time, but we can't. And going back and forth really presents an obstacle to giving our full attention to each. Now, it's not such a big deal if you're not giving your full attention to your email, but it is a big deal if you're not giving your full attention to your Zoom. Uh, for one thing, because you're not really processing that information. And as I learned in law school with the Socratic method, if you're called on and you don't know what the subject is because you weren't paying attention, you're in big trouble. And then the fourth and final thing is, is what's con sometimes called constant gaze. When we have to look at something for a long period, an hour, an hour and a half, two hours, maybe sometimes even 20 minutes, that's taxing on our eyes. And so it's exhausting for us. So these are the elements that really legitimately uh, cause Zoom fatigue. It's not just you, Denise. It's not just me. Uh, there are factors here that make us more exhausted and tax us to the point where it becomes an obstacle for our brains to process. I'm so glad that you brought up the toggling. I'm really glad because, look, I was so guilty of, you know, I was just knew that I was the best person in the world to, you know, be hitting six points all at once. I mean, I could get out there and, you know, I could make a gumbo, I could build a <laughs> website, I, and I still can. But something always failed. If I was toggling back and forth and not focusing, for starters, my brain got tired, my eyes got tired, I got cranky, and I would make somewhere at some point there was going to be a failure any one of those tasks that I was multitasking on, there was always going to be a, a point of failure. I was that point of failure. Mm -hmm. And I mean, even small failures tick me off. Big ones have me sitting on the floor sucking my thumb going, really, Denise? What the heck? <laughs> In a fetal thinking? position. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. Yeah. It's embarrassing. And when I make a big whopper, which I have been known to do, we've all done it, then you have to backtrack and fix it. And right. if you're not focusing on that and you're still trying to multitask, what the heck? So it took me a long time to realize that multitask is just not good for for us, not physically, not, yeah, we're ju we just shouldn't do it. So, and that brings me to, and focus is important. And, and here's the thing too, while you were talking, you know, you're, you're listening, you're trying to you know, lit, watch all these people do everything. If you're not focusing on them, that's kind of rude. They may not know it until you make a boo-boo, but it's really actually rude. They're sharing their time, their wisdom, their tips, whatever with you. And if you're not focused on that, that's just not nice. Yeah, it's not respectful. It's not no. a team member. And often you can see it because when you're looking, a lot of people, when they look at their email, it's on a second screen or they're checking their phone. So you can literally see them not giving attention to one of two things, either the camera, which is the ultimate you want to be looking at because that's eye contact, or looking at the Brady Bunch grid, looking at everyone else. If you're looking somewhere else, even if you're presenting and looking away for your notes, that break in connection is a break in connection. It's a break in eye contact. And if you're not paying attention, sometimes it is very obvious. It is, and I've seen it, and I always kind of, when it happens too much, and it's somebody who is really kind of the pivotal person in this Zoom, I catch myself going, why am I even here? They're not paying attention. Why are they bugging me? Right. Which is kind of, you know, it's, 
cranky and I admit that I get cranky about it, but you've got my attention for 15 minutes. Let's, you know, take advantage of it. Yeah, one of the things about being on Zoom versus being in a meeting, in a meeting, you're sitting there around the table. Everything about the environment and about the uh, the reason you're there is focused on a speaker. You may your eyes may dart to your phone for a second, or you may be distracted for a moment in a live meeting. But generally, because of your dress, your environment, the other people, the interaction, uh, you're focused on the speaker. When you're in a Zoom call, your body is at home. Everything is at home. You're right. more naturally inclined to do other things. You're more naturally inclined to be distracted and to lose focus. So you need to double down on your attention. You know, a lot of people think, well, it's a meeting, except it's on my computer. But a lot changes in your dynamic, in your brain, in your approach to it, in your mindset. So you actually need to double down deliberately on your attention in a Zoom meeting in a, Zoom meeting, in a way you wouldn't ordinarily have to do in an actual meeting. That makes sense. And, you know, it happens the same in, in podcasting. And I know it's not exactly the same kind of a venue, but when I first started out, I would hear people, they didn't know how to mute their microphone. So I would hear them talking to their dog. You know, I would be saying something and all of a sudden, you know, I hear Billy, get down, quit licking the cat's butt or something like that. Yeah, or, you know, you could tell that they just weren't paying any attention and I would have to kind of prompt or somebody's coughing. You know, there's there's a lot of things going on. So when you are virtual, like we're doing right now, you have to pay an awful lot of attention. Just for, as a for instance, I've shut down my mobile. I've shut down my, my keyboard so I can't accidentally click on anything and make that sound. I've taken my phone. I have a landline. I've taken that off the hook. You know, I'm trying to make absolutely sure that nothing is going to pull me away from the conversation that I'm having with you. Right. Remove those distractions. Remove even the exactly. opportunity to check your email. And there are, uh, there are a couple of other things you can do that I recommend. In Zoom in particular, there's something called speaker mode, which means you don't have to look at that Brady Bunch screen. In the top right, if you click on speaker mode, the speaker comes into the full screen. So you're looking at a single person versus a lot of people and taking in reactions and comments and, and the speaker. Uh, that will enable you to focus and that will be less taxing on your eyes to watch one person as that person is speaking. Uh, like I said, resist that urge to multitask. People should take breaks between Zoom sessions. It's a, not a good idea to go from one Zoom meeting to another, to another, to another. That's only going to increase that frustration for you, for me, and for everyone. So try to take a break between a session. Maybe check your email, but even better, take a walk. Uh, give your eyes a break. Do something different with them. Change your, you know, the distance between your eyes and a, and a subject matter. Do anything to really mix it up so that when you come to that second or third Zoom meeting, your eyes and your mindset and your health in many ways is a little more refreshed. Exactly. So is this is this something that people are just learning how to, to be really effective using and, and participating in Zooms? I mean, you've got a lot to share. So I'm guessing that this is kind of a, a learning curve that's, going to happen no matter what and things that nobody would have thought of before because Zoom was, you know, it's a tool but now it's almost a way of life Right, and <clears throat> excuse me, and when we moved from rooms to Zooms we didn't really have any training for it. Yeah, we had technology training, and that's what we often do in the office. All right, we'll click this to do that, and you got your nifty virtual background here, and you have your chat over there. You're good to go but so much has changed, like I said, in terms of that environment, and people have not been trained for it. Now, I paid close attention to it because I've been training public speakers for many years now, and one of the things I always train them is how to identify and make a strong point. So I was really paying attention to how people's points were affected when they were on a Zoom call versus on a, um, a live meeting. And, for example, when someone's on a Zoom call, they're likely to lower their volume because they think, well, I'm on a microphone now. This is technology. I don't need to keep my volume up as I would in an actual meeting. And what they need to understand is volume is not just about audibility. A, a louder volume conveys authority, credibility, 
confidence, competence. It makes you sound like you know more of what you're talking about, and you want those things on a Zoom call. So you need to keep up that strong volume, and you need to use your Zoom tools to your advantage as well. Some of the sometimes people think, well, because I'm on Zoom. I have a chat room, I can just ask for commentaries, ask for feedback, and that's really all I can do. But one of the things I like to do, Denise, is when I have a poll question, hey, do you think number one or number two, type that into chat. Or I'm going to show you three pictures. Which one most resonates with you, A, B, C, or D? Uh, throw that into chat. Or can anyone give me an example of this? You know, we see the virtual backgrounds as a plaything. Uh, we have fun virtual backgrounds of roller coasters. I have a scene from The Shining in a, <laughs> in a virtual background. But a lot of times I'm showing just one thing in a presentation. I'm showing how someone is gesturing. Or I'm giving three action words people can use to drive their point home. And I don't want to go through the whole share my screen. Can you see it? Is it the right screen? Do I have my PowerPoint up? That's a whole uh, big production when I just want to show one thing. So often I'll create an image out of those three words or out of that picture of an object and make that my virtual background. That way I'm able to say, hey, look behind me. You see this image? This is what you want to do. Or, hey, look behind me. Here are three things to keep your mind on. And in that way, people can still focus on me, the presenter, the speaker, but look behind me as if I was a newscaster and using a green screen uh, at these three things. And sometimes, Denise, I find that more impactful and more engaging than forcing the big share screen over to the PowerPoint. So this is about using those bells and whistles of Zoom to your advantage in new and creative ways to really drive your points. And I love that you're saying, excuse me, I have to cough now. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, I love that you're saying basically what I've always said about podcasting, keep it simple, stupid. You know, people have just so much of an attention span before after a while we're catching ourselves getting tense or actually irritated. And once you hit those points, you're tense and you're irritated, it's hard to come back from that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and there are other ways to to decrease the tension and the um, – that uh, stress that you're talking about. Sometimes we get stressed on Zoom but because people are talking over each other. They're not responding to each other. Like I said before, you get sort of relaxed and you're not as mindful of what you're doing as a communicator. So sometimes you are cutting people off. Sometimes oh. you are speaking too long. We're not getting the visual cues we normally get and we're not – we don't have that sense of training and that sense of responsibility that we sometimes have in a real meeting. So other things to be aware of when you're on Zoom, try to be aware of how quickly you respond to someone, how often you respond. Uh, I don't know if you've heard this before, but three before me. Have you ever heard that phrase? No. Uh, that means, yeah, that, it comes from kindergarten, but it basically means in a meeting, if you've been talking a lot, try to let three people speak before you do, if you're that dominator. And if you force that, the meeting, the voices will be more equitable. So be mindful of how often you respond, how long you've been speaking, and certainly if you're interrupting others because you're more inclined to do those things than you would be in an actual meeting. For some reason, because you're not in front of people actually, it seems like less of an offense and all your job is to do is to, to speak when you can, like you would in a conversation. Exactly. And that brings me to effective point making, which I wanted to ask you about. But And the reason I want to ask is I was monitoring, it was a political uh, thing the other night. I was monitoring for a friend of mine three hours. I thought I was going to die. <laughs> I've never heard so much garbage in my life, but that's neither here nor there. But the one thing I really liked was they imposed a three-minute rule. You had three minutes to make your point. Right. And that's something you should be aware of. And that's something that we pull from the room to the Zoom. You know, a lot of the things I coach people, I say, don't throw it all out the window and reinvent it. Some of these things, like I mentioned, like about volume, like about pausing. Pausing is a presenter, just a communicator's best friend, uh, because it's not just about building suspense and having a little technique to uh, bring people in. Pausing gives your mind the time to be precise. 
And sometimes I often say, and this is certainly true for Zoom, our, moun- our mouth runs ahead of our mind. So we're going blah, 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 and our mind is trying to catch up, saying, wait, slow down. Let me make the sense of those things. Let me pick the right words. Let me prioritize those words. We need to reverse that so that your mind is going ahead of your mouth, clearing the way, picking the words, setting the priority so that you can speak with precision. And that's about pausing, and that's also about slowing down. And one thing I want to reinforce here that I've reinforced before that's definitely important on Zoom is to recognize that your audience, the people you're looking at on a Zoom call, they need twice as long to process what you're saying as you need to make it. And why is this? Because as a speaker, what do we need to do? We need to have a thought and we need to say it. Often those two are happen at the same time. What does an audience need to do? They need to hear it. They need to process it. They need to digest it. They need to apply it. They need to decide if it's important to them, relevance. Uh, should I write this down? Should I tweet this? Uh, so many things are going into the re- reception of a point that we have to give people time to receive it. So when you make a point, especially if it's a big deal, if it's a a big statistic, or if it's your major point, the one thing you want people to walk away with, the big takeaway, pause after you say it, even on a Zoom call where everything seems cacophonous and everything seems processed in real time. It's not. Let that point sink in, and you will double your effectiveness and your impact on people remembering it and taking it away. Joel, can you give me uh, give me like a case study? Give give me something where you have made that point. You've made your point, and you've just kind of paused and let people deal with it. Can you give us like an example? Sure, I'll give you an example from a department head meeting I was at recently, and this was one of the executives talking. And uh, she gave a a preface where she was doing the job of an executive and a leader, contextualizing and giving the why behind the meeting. And it ended like this. Uh, If we do this right, we will have more impact on our audience. Now I'd like to bring up the next speaker, who is Sally, who's going to talk about – and you see how she just eliminated She ran it through. Yeah, Yeah, it was like a run add on one of those run through sentences where you're going, hang on, hang on, we need an, you know, where's the Oxford comma? Got it. Or it'll be like, you know, if we do this right, we will save more lives. Now I'm ready for Q&A. Who has a question? Yeah. And we're basically saying, here's the one thing I need to do. Deliver my point. Here it is. Here it is. Now I'm going to take it away and do something a lot less important. (laughs) So definitely in that moment where you're making your final point and you're moving on to another piece of business, insert an audio chapter break between those two. If we do this right, we're going to save more lives. Got it. Now, let me ask some questions if you have And see, that made, I mean, and I'm writing it in my head as you're saying it. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I'm putting the proper punctuation. I'm making, you know, the right. the little ellipsis if I have to, you know, it just makes sense. Understood. Okay, so let's go back to something that you said earlier, and I don't know that I had this on my list of things to, to ask you about, mm-hmm. but I think a lot of people don't understand that when you're on a Zoom meeting, you are effectively, I'm going to scare the bejeebers out of half my audience because people hate this, you're public speaking. So let's talk Absolutely. about that. Sure. You're Uh, giving a presentation, which means you have a point. In Zoom, sometimes it feels like everything is a conversation and we're not in presentation mode anymore. And we need to uh, adopt that thinking once again. And Denise, I want to be very clear. When I say presentation mode, I don't mean it's your time to give a 10-minute PowerPoint presentation. I'm talking about when your boss or the CEO says, does anybody have an ideas? And you virtually raise your hand, whether you do that through a tool or you just unmute yourself. And you say, I have an idea. And then you're in presentation mode because you want to champion that idea. So it goes back to the things I always say in regular meetings, because they're just as true for Zoom meetings, which is know your point. Use what I call the I believe that test to make sure it is a point. Uh, and you can focus on it, that you don't ramble, you use volume, you use pausing, you use evidence, and all the tools you would normally do to 
give strength behind that point. You just need to double down on that on Zoom because everything about your body and your mindset is telling you, no, this isn't a presentation. We're just chit-chatting. We're just talking about these things. Sometimes public speakers, I sometimes make fun of them because they begin with, let's talk about this subject. I want to I wanna spend some time talking about this subject. And that's not making a point. That's saying, I'm going to throw something out there and I'll talk about it a little bit. You'll talk about it a little bit. These ideas will swirl around and somehow magically a point will come out of it. And if we're lucky, maybe some action steps. And that's what I heard. Yeah. And when and you said that, I went, oh, geez. Right, exactly. Now, you'll see a lot of TED speakers begin with, I want to talk about. Uh, but just, I like it as a metaphor because it's, it's the opposite of making a point. It's transferring the burden of what you need to do as a presenter to your audience and also putting no uh, directive or no commitment behind it. As opposed to sometimes I give these power words, I suggest, I propose, I recommend. Those are power phrases you can insert into your presentation that will force you to make that point. If you're making a point, you're putting yourself on the line. You're putting yourself out there. But you know what, Denise? You know and I know that's what a leader does. They put themselves on the line to make a proposal, to make the strongest case they can, and hopefully it will have impact. Now, they may get overruled, but at least you've given your point the best chance to be heard, to be understood, and to be considered. Exactly. Joel, I have to ask you because I'm listening very intently. I've read your book multiple times. What I'm hearing here and what I know about public speaking, which is what we're doing right now, is we're selling. We are absolutely absolutely selling. And I think that that may be lost in a lot of the technology and how people are presenting themselves. So let's talk about that because I think it's a very important component that people may not recognize. Yeah, when I think of Zoom I and making points on Zoom or selling, let's use that word because uh, it's important, I'm reminded of a meeting I had many years ago that I talk about in my book where the president of my organization at the time got everyone into a room, and this was everyone. This is the writers, the editorial, which is the group I was in. It was also the ad sales people and the marketing people. And she hired a hardcore salesperson, like a Glengarry Glen Ross kind of super salesperson to train us on sales. How do you close the deal? Always be closing. And I remember myself and my colleagues who were in editorial, editors and writers, we were saying, why are we here? Uh, This is for the marketing people. These are the people who go to the fancy off-sites. They're the money people. We're not in sales. We're in editorial. Well, Denise, we were wrong. Because if you have an idea, that is as valuable as a product. And you have to sell it. So as you said, to reinforce that, when you have a point of view and a point you're trying to get across, you are in sales. And we are all in sales, whether you're a CEO or you're an intern, because you're always going to have a point that you want to get across. And you need to use these sales techniques as if it was a vacuum cleaner and you were in front of uh, you know, someone in the 60s. You need to use those sales techniques uh, to get it across, those old school things like – Uh, Here is a pen. Sell me this pen. And the idea that you're not saying it's blue and has a cap, you're saying what the value of being able to express yourself with this tool is. So you can go back to all those important lessons about public speaking, about making a strong point, bring them across to Zoom, and again, double down on that mindset because know that there's Zoom fatigue and know that that Zoom platform is going to disincline you from being in sales mode. One would hope. And listen, to the audience, I can almost feel some cringes. We're talking about two things that are miserable, miserable thoughts for a lot of people, whether they recognize that they're doing it practically every minute, public speaking and sales. I mean, seriously, watch a three-year-old. How many three-year-olds do you know that don't make their point and get their way? They're phenomenal. We are always very very. I mean, we're always selling something, whether we recognize it or not. We're always public speaking. If we're just chatting with somebody in the grocery line, that's public speaking because other people are listening. They're judging. We're always doing both these things. And for some reason, both of these topics just scare some people straight out of their their shoes. I mean, it terrifies them. It shouldn't. It's something we do all the time. Right. 
And there are also things you should be doing on Zoom that are that are in the realm of communication, I would argue, but are separate from public speaking. And I just want to remind gotcha. people of these things. One of them is active listening. So we know we should be active listeners when there's a presenter in a live audience. Not only does it show respect, but it gives real-time feedback back to the person and consideration back to the person who's speaking. So I'd like, if, you, if you don't mind, I'd like to give some tips to remind people what active listening is and how it could be used on Zoom. Oh, uh, thank you. Go. One of them, and this is true for any setting, uh, this is even true in relationship counseling, so maybe write this one down. Um, you want to face the speaker and maintain eye contact. And just to be clear, I want to reinforce on Zoom, eye contact is not looking at those faces as it would be in any other environment. Eye contact is looking at that small, cold, black dot <laughs> that's at the top of your laptop or in a, sometimes in a separate camera that's on top of your screen. It is very awkward and uncomfortable to look into a black dot and to pretend that that's a person. People do it all the time on television. You think they're talking to the show host, but they're actually looking into a camera, not at a person. Um, So for that reason, you don't need to be looking at that camera all the time. That's going to be difficult and awkward. But if you do have a major point to make, if you are coming around to the end of your cell, Use that opportunity. You already know eye contact is important. So give eye contact by doing that last part or that very important part where you're directly into the camera, and that's where you're really bringing it home. Another key thing that I don't always see in in active listening skills is the power of the nod. Often we think we're a good listener if we smile, uh, we applaud, we give eye contact. But this is what nodding does. Nodding communicates to a presenter, I have received your point. I'm buying what you're selling, and nothing is more uh, appreciated or more practically valuable to a speaker than to see an audience member nodding. And we know this because imagine if the the audience didn't nod. Imagine if they they shook their head. That would be the worst thing that that can happen. So the opposite of that is nodding. Uh, Also, keep an open mind when you're hearing something. Uh, Don't be imagining what do I need to say in response. Truly listen and process it. Sometimes it helps to visualize what they're saying, especially if you're like me, a visual learner. Then you could process it better. Finally, like we said, don't interrupt. Don't finish their sentences. And do this thing that's called imago. Denise, are you familiar with imago training? I'm not. Okay, it's this idea that, again, comes from relationship counseling. Um, which is this really good idea if you're listening to someone and to confirm what they're saying. Basically, you have two people, uh, the speaker and the receiver. The speaker says, I believe that this is a problem or a challenge in our workplace. The second person doesn't just respond to that. They say, let me understand you correctly. You're saying that you see this challenge in the workplace. And the first person says, yes, that is correct. Or the first person says, well, not exactly, this is what I meant. And you do not proceed until there's a confirmed understanding between person one and person two that uh, we understand both the problem. And that is really important because a lot of people hear a question or hear a situation, and then they move on based on their understanding, but it's a misunderstanding of the question. And then you're just wasting time because you're not actually – addressing the concern that the person had. And you could see why this is true for relationship counseling. The first person says, I think you're leaving your shoes around the house. The second person says, oh, I understand what you're saying. You're saying I leave my shoes around the house. So that's where it comes from. But it's, you're, doing, you're giving your, the person you're responding to, you're giving them tremendous consideration. And this is why it's important for a leader who wants to show consideration, wants to show listening skills to their teams. Uh, you're showing them tremendous uh, consideration by reinforcing what they're saying. Sometimes you see this in presidential debates. President Clinton, in his debates, he introduced this notion of when you're talking to an audience and they say, I'm concerned about this, he didn't respond right away. He would say, let me understand what you're saying. You're saying that you can't afford your daily life based on what you're making at work. And it was a, it's a fantastic tool to show consideration. So we should try to do that as part of our listening skills. Absolutely. One of these Zoom meetings, and I love that we're talking about this because this recent Zoom meeting that I was on, 
is still bugging the heck out of me. I have to tell you. Normally, I just go, okay, that was great. Yeah, I can walk off, put the, you know, whatever tools or tips or advice were handed me, write them down, put them to work, or just go, "Mm, it's not for me, but maybe later. There was this one particular person who clearly thinks she's the smartest person in any room, and she spent an entire hour grimacing, shrugging, playing with her hair, just being nasty. And she was just one, pro- I can't stand her. I never want to come across this person again. I had never met her before then. I don't want to ever meet her again. And shame on her. I mean, she yeah. absolutely took over the entire meeting because people were so distracted by watching her be a little snot. And there's no other polite way of saying it. She was a brat, a 25 year old brat. Right. It was, it was horrible. Yeah, and it, it was really bad. Let's understand this in the communication frame. So we don't like brats, and we don't like people who are showing uh, faces of discontent. But let's 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 pull that out a little bit and say, well, what is that person communicating? Uh, dissatisfaction, anger, um, unhappiness, a lot of things that are very distracting. And if you want to correct that, you you don't want to or may not be effective to say, hey, stop being a brat or change your facial expressions. Say, can you show expressions that are supportive of the speakers and supportive of the organization? So you'll see that from time to time. But you know what, um, Denise, often you'll see someone eating a sandwich. I know. uh, Looking aside, you'll see half of someone's face. (laughs) They don't even, I think, oh, my gosh, you didn't even look at yourself. You have a very easy way to look at yourself, as easy as a mirror, and you don't see that we can only see your eyes. Or we can see that we can see that you can see that because you have the light source behind you and not in front of you, you're completely in shadow. If you only looked at yourself, you would see that. And get, that gets into a really important point about Zoom that I want to make sure we talk about, which is framing. Um, if you gave a speech in a real meeting room, you wouldn't do it from the back of the room. You wouldn't do it uh, with your face behind uh, the podium. You wouldn't cover half of your head. So why would you do that in a Zoom meeting? So my recommendations are you should fill the frame with mostly your head and some of your shoulders. And this may mean getting closer to the camera. This may mean moving your your monitor up and down so you're not looking up, you're not looking down, but you're as close to eye level as possible with your camera. And this includes your background. So, yeah, we love these, um, these backgrounds that we use sometimes of the, the funny things or the pictures of our kids, the virtual backgrounds. But you know what? That can be distracting. Now, people love those. So I don't mind them so much if you're merely in a meeting and it's not something very visually distracting. But if you are presenting, two things happen. One, it's a distraction. But One of the aspects of presenting you most want to take care to showcase is authenticity. And if you have an element, a visual element, that is not authentic as part of your presentation, so here's my face, but my background is a a beach scene from the Bahamas, you are then communicating something that is inauthentic and artificial, and why would you want to do that? So whenever I'm presenting, I get rid of those backgrounds, and I make it very uh, clear so it's just me. Ultimately, you want your background to indicate professionalism and maybe indicate expertise. If you're a lawyer, you can have law books back there. If you're a veterinarian, it can be a veterinarian's office. So those are the two things I allow and the two things that can work in your favor. Now, here's a funny story, Denise. I wrote this piece for Harvard Business Review about using Zoom and virtual platforms and using them well. And one of the tips I wrote in my original version was don't have animals or kids in your Zoom call because they're distracting to you and your audience. And I got pushback from the editors. And they said, well, sometimes, A, two things. One, you can't really avoid that sometimes. Depending on your situation, the kids are at home and not at school. You don't have another caregiver. And two, what's the big deal? People love seeing kids just like they love when you share pictures of your kids. So it's fun. really. Charlie is, you know, picking his nose. Ha, ha, ha. (laughs) (laughs) So I had to compromise with these editors a little bit. And I said, all right, you know, if you have a child sitting in your lap, if a cat runs across or you want to have your cat in your screen, as I sometimes do, um, that's okay if you're merely an audience member. It is a little distracting, but if you can't uh, 
uh, do anything about it at the time, let it go. However, I am not going to give you that if you are presenting, if you've been tasked with a major presentation. I have seen, Denise, for sure, I'm not making this up, a senior executive give very important information about uh, the number of people that are working at the organization and if they're going to be layoffs. Something as crucial as that, and you could not hear her because her kids were watching cartoons and they were often sitting on her lap and she was often telling them, no, 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 Bobby, do this. No, no, uh, Sally, uh, get off me. You could not hear the most crucial thing. And I said to myself, I don't understand. Does she live in a one-room uh, you know, house? Uh, is there not any caregiver? You know, She knew she had to give this presentation. Is there not any other caregiver, whether it be a neighbor, a friend, a, a parent, anybody, to be able to watch those kids? Was there not a videotape that she could have put in front of them? Uh, if you know you were giving a major presentation, if it's something where communication is critical, you need to remove those distractions, including your children, anything you can do, because it is not just a distraction to your audience. It is a distraction to you. So you lose on both counts, both in terms of what they can receive and what you can give. And Joel, just listening to that, I caught myself wondering how this person who clearly has some kind of a strong you know, position in, in the company – has she no critical thinking skills? I mean, that's where I went. Is she really this goofy it, that may be unkind? But that's exactly where I went. It's like, you didn't think this out. How can I trust you to take care of my business? Right. And I think it, it really represents that sense of when you go to Zoom, some things are okay. And we have given people liberty to have their kids on Zoom calls and to have things going on in the background. And, you know, it's funny. I, um, I sometimes go outside and we have a friend who comes over and we talk and I live right by a train station. When that train goes by, she keeps talking, even though you can't listen to her. And I always wonder, do you realize that we can't hear what you're saying when the train goes by? <laughs> And I'm reminded of that because it's about a mindset. You think as a speaker, all right, well, people love the kids, and I can get this across. It's not that she was a poor leader or that she didn't have a sense of confidence of what she needed to do. It's that she made the wrong real, you know, uh, real-time assumptions about what she could do, how she can get her point across. It's not that different from thinking you can do your email and present on Zoom or be a responsible participant at the same time. It's about these assumptions. We need to change those assumptions of what I need to do. And often I say, well, think of yourself at a normal business meeting in a room. No kids, no animals. You're giving your full attention. You're not trying to do two things at once. Try to imagine yourself in the real setting and bring that across. Imagine yourself in that live setting when you're in a Zoom setting. And let those lessons, let those mindsets also be still intact. Don't uh, relax and allow a lot of other distractions interfere with your ability to champion your point. And that's probably the best thing I've heard you say yet. They're all terrific points, but that mindset, show up, be professional, treat it as you know, if you are right there in the room, that's really, really brilliant, and I hope people take that to heart. Yeah, and the little things count. If you, uh, and I'm going to speak from my own experience here. If I take a shower in the morning, I feel more professional when I'm on a Zoom call than when I didn't, uh, and obviously I would have if I was going to work versus put it off. If I'm wearing pajama bottoms, I'm going to feel less uh, professional. If I'm in a room where everything's going on around me and messy, I'm going to feel less professional. Um, even if I'm wearing a T-shirt that I would not have worn to the office that day, a part of me feels less professional. So all these little things can help remind you that it is a professional setting, which can hopefully trigger those professional mindsets that you want to keep intact as you're making points on Zoom. And you don't realize in talking about pajamas, and you know, a lot of people do. I live in a virtual world. Everything I do is virtual. Look, I get 
dressed every single day. You ought to see my closet, Joel. It looks like Nordstrom's <laughs> threw up in there. I very rarely leave my home. I'm an introvert. I'm a highly functioning introvert. But when I hit my office in the morning after I've fed everybody my pets and walked everybody and done everything I need to do, I've got my strappy stilettos on. I've got an ankle-length dress on. It's rare today I have shorts and a T-shirt on, but I'm going to be hitting the yard. But they're cute, and I'm not distracted Mm -hmm. by thinking seriously. I'm not distracted by feeling like I'm unprofessional unprofessional, or just looking kind of grubby and you know, icky. I just don't feel that way. And because I don't feel that way, I can hear your points and then get to my points. I right. think we don't recognize how small things like not brushing your hair and just yanking it into a ponytail before you hit your, your desk can be very distracting. You may not notice yeah, it, but that. at some level it's bothering you. Yeah, and we think that, well – If I relax about these five things, that's not going to bleed over and make you relax about ten things, including things you didn't want to feel relaxed about? I mean, when we go on vacation, we sit on the beach. uh, It's not just about having a drink with a little umbrella in it and wearing sunglasses. Everything about us becomes more relaxed. So when you become relaxed about your mindset and your dress and your approach and your environment, you are more inclined to relax about things like making your point, being clear, uh, uh, addressing your audience, and being sharp, being attentive. Those things are going to relax as well. So don't take that chance and think that I can now relax these five things, but I'm going to stay completely committed to these other things. That's going to cause that Zoom fatigue, which we were talking about. It will. And you know what? You mentioned TED Talks some time ago. I was listening to my very famous, my very favorite TED Talk is still Amy Cuddy, where she's mm-hmm. talking, you know, that I can't remember the name right. of it now, right. but I've, yeah. what, is, what was it? Um, it was about body language. Body uh, language. How you That's position right. yourself for self. Exactly right. And to this day, I, you know, I've listened to it, watched it multiple times over the years. To this day, when I'm getting ready to jump on my podcast, I will stand up, I do my Wonder Woman pose, I take several deep breaths, Mm -hmm. and I'm off and running. You can't see me, but I do it because breathing is important. We'll talk about that, you know, how your, your voice training, breathing is very, very important. But it also sets me up like, I got this, I'm Wonder Woman, and off I go. I have a terrific time. I never don't do that because the one time I didn't do it, I caught myself stumbling. I wasn't prepared. I knew that I was distracted because I hadn't done my Wonder Woman post. I know it sounds ridiculous, but everybody go watch that and you'll understand. So that leads me to my my next thing, voice training. Again, I'm going to go back to this thing I had to watch the other day and the voice, the, you know, the sneering and the, twitching and everything that went on you know most of the time she had what I call her resting bitch face on she was just a horrible little person but oh geez but the voice oh my I actually had to mute her because she just grated on me at every level this poor girl grated on me but her voice was just so bad so let's talk about that because if people are going to be listening to you you have to be able to reach them by not screeching, by not using valley girl speak. I didn't right. know that was still a thing. Apparently it is. So let's let's talk about voice training because I think that's one of the bigger important things that I wanted to ask you about. Sure. And I, for me, the things that I pay attention to the most because I think they're the most destructive are really three things. One of them we talked about a little bit already, which is volume and the importance of raising your volume. This is everybody. So many good things happen when you raise your volume. The other two I see a lot. One's called vocal fry and the other is called up talk. Now vocal fry is when you end with a kind of a groggy sound like this. So I think this is the thing we need to do and if we do it right, maybe we'll get there. Um, And there are some people who think that, uh, often the Kardashians, they are excellent at vocal fry, if you want the best illustration of that. And some people have taken it to mean that vocal fry is a good thing. Well, it is not a good thing. It doesn't sound good. It sounds like your nails on a chalkboard. And what it is indicative of is what I call a power fail. So you start with volume, you start with power, 
and then it kind of trails off because you started strong, and then you lose power, and your volume goes down, and then you start croaking. So the antidote to that croaking, that vocal fry, and I say this to my clients all the time, and these are you know CEOs, uh, start your uh, end your sentences with the same power with which you began those sentences. Often we start with a bang. This is what we need to do, but we lose power for whatever reason. Maybe we didn't have lunch that day or didn't have our coffee or retired, and we lose it toward the end of the sentence. Keep that power up from the beginning of your statement to the end of your statement, hopefully from the beginning of your presentation to the very end of your presentation. I often tell people if you're not exhausted at the end of a major presentation, and even if it's seven to ten minutes, you're not giving it enough strength. So that's vocal fry, and that's the antidote to that. And people can Google that and see examples of that. The third one, which you were talking about, uh, sometimes you call it valley girl speak. It's called up talk. It's when you end your sentences like this. I think this is the thing we need to do. I think we need to make this approach. This will help us save lives. This will help us sell more Coca-Cola, I think, because I'm asking you. I don't know. I'm not sure. That's why I'm asking questions. (laughs) That's what it sounds like, and I do this test with an audience as part of my workshop where I just say numbers. I don't say words. And I end the first group of numbers with question marks. One, two, three, four, five. And the second group I end with periods. One, two, three, four, five. Uh I asked them which sounded more confident, competent, and assured and authoritative. Now, they were just numbers, so they had no context clues. A hundred percent of the time, they vote for the periods. And then I say, before we move on, let me make sure, let me do a mago. Let me make sure I understand what you're saying. You're saying is that when someone ends with a period versus a question mark, they instantly sound more authoritative, competent, credible, uh, and confident. They said yes. So then we applied words. And they see that when you end in a question mark, even if you're not asking a question, when you just have that up talk, you're basically saying, I'm not sure. I need my audience to affirm what I'm saying. When you enter the period, you're saying, this I believe. Now, that's all well understood or said and done. Uh, It's hard because I've met some college students who can say everything in what I call power periods. And I've met some world leaders and CEOs who naturally say everything ending with a question mark. So it's not a, not a related to how good a public speaker you are or your experience or even your training. It's some sort of natural instinct. So to correct that, if you notice yourself using UpTalk, the first thing you need to do is train your ear for it. Listen to other speakers. Listen for that question mark. If you train your ear for it over time with practice and with pausing because that allows you to be deliberate. Joel, you're still here? You okay. We lost oh, yeah. you there, can you repeat oh, that sorry. first? You just went away for just a, a brief moment there. Oh, okay. Um, when you train your ear for that up talk, sorry, I think my hand went over my phone. I should recognize that. Uh, and when you become familiar with other people ending in question marks versus ending in periods, then you are more likely to be deliberate about how you use periods or question marks. Also slow down, because as we discussed before, that gives you the time to be deliberate. Oh, I'm coming to the end of my sentence. I want to make sure to hit this with a power period. So my recommendation for your audience is to train your ear for it first. Don't feel like tomorrow you could start turning those question marks into periods if you're naturally an up talker. Uh, But when you train yourself, when you train your ear over time and you practice it and you make it a priority, you will get to the point where you are able to end your sentences with periods, thus communicating this I believe. I love that, and I'm so glad you brought that up because I catch myself doing it. And I finally figured out I do it, number one, because I'm tired. I'm just whatever, my energy just ran out, and I'll catch myself kind of, and it's a Southern thing too. We tend to do that as well. Yeah. But I also recognize that when I'm doing that, and I'm starting to annoy myself with it, that I'm also drawling. Yeah, I realize that I sound far more Southern than I ought to, and I'm drawling, and I'm ending things with a question. That's when it's time for me to just stop talking and you know, go do something different. 
Yeah, often it's the end, and it's a big peril because often it's the end of our communications, the end of our sentences where we lose that power. And those are the most critical parts because we're saying because of this, because of that, because of that, we need to do this. And the we need to do this sounds like we need to do this. Uh, so we need to have that energy. And sometimes if you're tired or you don't have that energy, on Twitter I share a lot of these tips visually. And one of them says, uh, the person who should be most excited and energetic about your expression is you. If you need to eat a candy bar, splash your face with water, run around the block, you know, do what you ever need to do physically, do those power poses that Amy Cuddy talks about so that you can have the energy that enables you to not only share your point, but to sell and be a champion of that point. But the most critical thing I'm hearing you say is you have to be aware of it. Oh, yeah. And many and people are clearly not. Then you have no, no hope, no hope for you. You should be nervous. Right, right. And it's pretty amazing because, you know, once, and I never listen to myself, and I've shared this with you before. I always, if I hear my, my own voice, I kind of cringe because I keep waiting to hear myself say, happy birthday, Mr. President. I think I sound ridiculous, so I don't ever go listen to myself if I can avoid it. But I'm listening to myself all the time, and when I catch myself doing you know, that kind of up talk or drawling, mm-hmm. like, geez, Denise, and I have to stand up and take deep breaths and do my Wonder Woman pose again right. and get myself back where I need to be. Right. Now, to be clear, you don't need to um, divorce yourself from your regionalistic accents. Those can be quite charming. Uh, but what you do need to do is always put power behind them. Sometimes people think they need to be this sort of Midwest newscaster without any sense of where they came from or their upbringing. Uh, that's not true. We like presenters and public speakers who are unique, who are individual, and who are taking advantage of their linguistic idiosyncrasies uh, to be more powerful and engaging. Absolutely, and I agree with you. The most interesting voices I hear are strong voices who are not trying to pretend to be somebody else. You can tell. Right. I mean, you really can't. I, I hate to watch TV or movies, especially if it's a southern accent that they're trying to emulate because, oh, my God, don't – just stop. Just stop. You know, just – they're awful. Okay, so that's my little rant. So let's – we've got one more point I wanted you to make. Sure. We're going back to the Zoom. Strategic use of chat. Those can be so, 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 so distracting. So share some tools, tips. You know, how do people get very strategic so they're not just kind of losing focus and bumping across each other? Right. First know that – You have an opportunity to, but more importantly, you have a responsibility to utilize interaction in Zoom because Zoom allows you to interact a lot more easily and to greater effect than you could ever hope for in an actual meeting. So leverage that. Some people say every five minutes in a long presentation, let's say an hour, or twice in the middle of even a shorter one, you should be asking your audience for some feedback or for some content. Now, that doesn't mean just saying, all right, if anyone has some points of view, uh, put it in the chat, because that's too broad. You and I know that you need to give an audience a direction, a particular question to answer. So before your presentation or before you're coming on to make your point, uh, write down a few questions you want to ask your audience. Everyone tell me what your biggest challenge is to speaking successfully. Type that into chat. And then you want to respond to those people in the chat. Mary, I I heard you say that you're worried to be loud because you'll be perceived as aggressive. Or John, I hear you have a problem of rambling. You say too much and you need to stick to your point. Uh, That's great because we're going to get to both of those and I'll make a special point of addressing those in the presentation. So that's one thing. Use the chat to your advantage to do real time back and forth, but make it meaningful and respond to and call out those people in the chat. They want to be considered. Otherwise, you know, if, if you say, everyone tell me this, and they do it, and you just move on and don't acknowledge it, the people who chatted are thinking, well, why did I bother? Well, that, that seemed like a useless um, exercise. So make sure to do something with that feedback, if only to call out a few of them and to say, we, I don't have time to read them all off, but thank you for your appreciation, and I'm going to be taking note of these later. 
The other thing to do is, is something I mentioned earlier. We think, oh, if we want to do a poll in Zoom, we have to bring out the big bad polling engine and someone has to train me on that and everyone has to do this, that. Uh, no, I almost never use the polling engine. I just say, you know, one of the things I do when I train about uh, your the way you frame yourself in a Zoom call, I have this big picture of a Zoom call of, of a seven by seven grid of people. And I have numbers across the top and letters going down. And in chat, I say, give me the coordinates of someone who you think does the best framing. And they go, 1A, 2B, 3C. Now give me the coordinates of someone who you think is not being successful in terms of their framing. And they tell me in chat. And it's a back and forth that's really fun because then it's almost like a game. But it can be Y or N for yes or no. It can be here are five things. Tell me, write the number of the thing you feel is most important. Um, audiences love that because they love to be part of the presentation. And you will keep them engaged and make it less likely that they will read their email and try to uh, do several things at once. So by asking, using the word ask, which is one of my favorite words, along with the word no, because that's a complete sentence, but by asking, you're actually opening doors to understanding other people. Is that correct? Absolutely, and you're inviting that understanding, and you're considering that understanding. It's a three-step process with chat. Ask for it, consider it, and acknowledge it out loud. You know, all staffs, all teams, they love acknowledgement, especially from a leader. And this is a great and easy way to do it. Jim, I saw your chat. Great question. I'm going to address that right now because I want to make sure we're clear about that. You know, what's more powerful to an audience than to hear that, especially from a leader? No kidding. And, you know, when you do that, all of a sudden, if they've wandered, if their attention has wandered, all of a sudden they're like, Ooh, and they snap right back into focus, right. don't they? Right, and it's not shaming. You're not doing that Socratic method I learned in college, which is, Joel, what do you think of this case? Uh, you're saying, everyone, vote here. So it gets someone's attention, but it doesn't spotlight them. So they are part of the process, but sort of on their own time. They're given the liberty to participate in a way that's fair and engaging. See, I didn't know all of this about Zoom. I get roped into them. I never start them, but I do get roped into them. And some are terrific, and others I'm like, oh, my gosh, that was 60 minutes of time. I'll never get back. But you know what I've never really done, and I will now, is start to dissect them. How yeah. is this working? What's going on? What you know? What could be better? And basically learn if I ever do have to have my own Zoom chats, I'll know what to do. But maybe I can even, if there's people that I know well, I can you know send a note and say, hey, this was terrific. But what do you think about maybe doing this a little bit differently? And this is why I'm suggesting it. Would that be yeah. appropriate or not? It would because in Zoom chat, at the very bottom where you're chatting, there's a drop down above it where you get to indicate, do I want this to go to everyone on the chat or do I want this to be a private chat to an individual person? So often when I'm uh, running or attending Zoom meetings and I know someone's camera is off or they're unmuted and they should be muted because we could hear what's going on beyond them, or I just want to ask someone a question, uh, what do you think she meant by that? I will use the chat, and I will select their name from the drop-down so I could send them a private message. And I could use it tactically that way. And, you know, I want to reinforce, Denise, that this is one of the ways that Zoom has an advantage over an actual meeting. You can be more interactive very easily, and the chat is the best place, uh, not just the only place, but, the, but clearly the best place to do that. If you give an hour-long lecture in Zoom, and you are not engaging, and you are not using chat, you are under-presenting and under-utilizing the tool you have. No kidding. Okay, I have to ask you this because I don't know the, the answer. Is there any? You've been doing a little mini training here, and I thank you for that, but is there any formal training that you're doing to help people with this? Are you creating something, or does something like a course exist at this time? Courses do exist at this time. You could Google them. I don't train on the technology and on using Zoom in particular, but if you work for a company, I would get in touch with your IT team 
or someone you're comfortable with on your IT team who can do a one-on-one -on -one training for you. So that's the first thing I would recommend you do. Or if you have a friend who's good in it, you know, you and I, Denise, uh, uh, tomorrow we could set up a Zoom call, and I could just take you through all the little tools and tricks. It wouldn't even take that long. The third thing I recommend people do is to go to Zoom events, free ones. You, don't, you shouldn't have to pay for them. And see what those presenters do. See how they use chat. See how they use responses like the clap and the thumbs up. Uh, see how they engage the audience. See how they share their screen or use virtual backgrounds. You can learn the most from watching other people do it effectively. Terrific. When you say virtual backgrounds, a friend of mine, I use her quite a bit for uh, creatives, you know, creative work. And she just put up, she did this for an author. She just created this fantastic Zoom background that basically is a white background. I think it might be painted bricks. But over to the left of the person is her books. All of her books are there. And that's yep. all that is. You know, you know instantly that this person is an author and what she's writing. I thought that was just brilliant. Yeah, let's say you're doing an interview as an author. Why not have it back there? You would if it were, if you're on Entertainment Tonight. So I think you can use it in that way, but you can also use it in other ways. I'm part of a, a, a committee at work, and we're very proud of ourselves. We have our own little logo. And when we meet on Zoom, we all create a virtual background, which is white, but with our logo on it. So we all feel very part of that community, not only in our communications, but also uh, visually with that logo. It's like wearing a patch. Exactly. Joel, this has been absolutely fascinating. There's a reason I get you to come back time and time again. But before, and we're no longer streaming, we're streaming, uh, but I, well, I'm just lying to you. We're no longer streaming, but we are recording, so none of this is going to go away as soon as the show renders. But, Joel, before I let you go, where can people find you? And tell people how to find your book because it's a terrific book. Sure, I really appreciate that. The book is called Get to the Point, Sharpen Your Message, and Make Your Words Matter. And you can find it anywhere you buy books. It is certainly on Amazon. But to find more, you can also find the book and to learn more about me. And I, I believe in handing out tips with an open source approach. So I, I want everyone to be stronger communicators and stronger point makers. So I give out a lot of free stuff, free ideas, articles that I've written on my website. And that's at www.joelschwartzberg.net, J-O-E-L-S-C-H-W-A-R-T-Z-B-E-R-G, joelschwartzberg.net. Or, and you can certainly follow me on Twitter, where I love to be these days and share a lot of these ideas. And there I'm the Joel Truth, T-H-E-J-O-E-L-T-R-U-T-H, the Joel Truth on Twitter. Joel, thank you so much. It's been, as always, wonderful speaking with you. And I thank you for all of the wonderful tips and advice, the many training that you've shared with our audience today. And Pardon my voice, I'm losing it. Before we say goodbye, I really am, I would like to remind our audience to be sure to look for us in iTunes and anywhere else you can consume your business podcast. Just look for your partner in Success Radio and take us along on your journey. Again, thank you so much, Joel. Thank you, Denise, and thank you to the listeners. Get your voice heard. If you would like to launch your own far-reaching podcast, Contact Denise Griffiths at yourofficeontheweb.com and go to the podcast tab.